Funnily enough, I don't usually do a lot of article requests these days, but there are a few people who wanted me to do this one in a video, and I thought, ah, jeez, this is one of those Persona 5 hot takes, we've seen this a million times before. But then I actually read it, two paragraphs in, and I'm laughing my ass off. So to those of you who suggested me this, thank you for this amazing read, and I'm gonna share this with you guys because this person is some of the most pathetic human beings I've ever come across on the internet. So this is an article about Persona 5, and it talks about how Persona 5 Royale's mature love interests read for toxic masculinity. I think this is mostly going to be talking about the student-teacher romance between the main character Ren and Kawakami, but my expectations were blown away immediately thanks to the presence of the first two paragraphs. The first paragraph consists of the writer expressing her disappointment that it's very difficult to love video games. Why? Because there are so many video game scandals, such as the harsh labor conditions of a AAA studio, which we talk about many times in the past, the harassment allegations, which I've also talked about in the past, and also the mistreatment of non-straight and non-cis people in gaming, one that I I also somewhat talk about in my very recent video, also in relation to Atlas games in the past. Unlike a lot of people, writer, I do care about these issues. Anyway, the second paragraph says that the writer considered Persona 4 Golden one of her favorite games. Same. Also see my video on that one. All the links are down below. And this is where things get very funny. When I finished playing it, it stung to say goodbye, and I, honest to God, considered starting the whole thing over, despite sinking 90 hours into it the first time around. However, here I am, six or so years later, terrified to go back to it. Jeez, writer, I know that Persona 4 got some really scary stuff, but chill out. It's not like you're gonna get wrecked in the same way that most people will when they play Nocturne. It's not like the game's gonna have themes and characters that people willfully misinterpret so that they can have some sort of validation that they exist in the world. Oh wait, they absolutely do. So you know what, writer? Maybe you do have valid concerns about the game, in the same way I too have valid concerns about adults who express that they are terrified to play one of the most lighthearted JRPGs to have ever been released. The writer expressed that throughout the years, Persona the developer Atlas has found itself repeatedly in hot water for buzzwords, buzzwords, and buzzwords. As I expressed and illustrated many times in the past, especially in my last video, a lot of these criticisms towards Atlas are trash criticisms based on misinformation, ideological disagreements, and people's delusional tendencies to shove their head cannons to other people's faces, which makes me to be on their defense many times. If you're gonna attack Atlas, attack them for their tendency of milking franchises and for making Persona 5 the animation and the $300 English the Blu-ray, which to be fair isn't entirely their fault, but then again, it's also not their fault that the version is sailing the high seas and get hijacked by pirates, assuming that there are pirates who will do it because the anime is trash dog. Going back to the article, the writer talks about how the discussions about Atlas games with her friends are always like this. It's a fantastic game, apart from the bad stuff which really sucks, but just try to push past it. I don't know if I should say that your friend is woke for saying that the game has themes that they disagree with politically, or base for ignoring ignoring it because not everything in their life will align to their political opinions. The writer, however, couldn't get through it, and for that reason, she is terrified to replay that game. <laughs> How pathetic do you have to be as an adult to express that you're not able to replay a game because you're terrified that the game might have themes that are incongruent with your political opinions? I am sorry to say this, writer, but there are many fictional content in the world that are amazing that have problematic themes. We can have a discussion about those problematic themes, but I think there are bigger issues at hand when those problematic themes terrify you so much to the point where you are unable to replay the game at all. This article reminds me of one of the biggest reasons why I read articles like this. It's not just an article with bad takes that I disagree with, it's an article that shows a glimpse in the writer's thought process. It's an article that shows the world that pathetic people like this exist in this world. Not wanting to replay a video game because you're tired of it is fine. Not wanting to replay a game because you're terrified of it only makes sense if it's either a horror game or a really bad game, not a lighthearted comedy JRPG. Basically what I'm trying to say is that you have issues, writer, and you need to talk to someone. The writer then continues by admitting that the game is amazing. The music is amazing, the gameplay is amazing, the style is amazing, the characters are amazing, but the harder you look, the more cracks you see. Then the writer complains about that scene in Persona 4 Golden where the fat girl sits on Yosuke's scooter and completely destroys it because it's body shaming. So we can't make fun of obese people, can we, writer? Are you going to say that there's nothing wrong with having an unhealthy lifestyle that makes you to have a body so big that it breaks scooters when you sit on it? Then the writer continues to talk about a good ending in Catherine where Erica, a non-cis woman, is... 
male? That never happens at any point in any of the game's good endings. It only happens in C. Catherine's alternative ending, and even then, you took that particular event completely out of context. The reason why Erika is male is because they time travel into the past where Erika hasn't transitioned. So of course she is a male, and it is heavily implied that Erika will transition in the future. Do you see why these critiques are trash? It's because they're based on either misinformation or not agreeing with the writer's personal belief. The writer then continues by saying that Atlas's ideologies inhabit their games, and so is your article writer. What makes you better? Because you smear them with buzzwords after buzzwords? And despite many of the attempts in fixing the problem, such as in Full Body and in Royal, the game still has things that doesn't align with the writer's political ideology, and the writer is gonna talk about that here. We haven't even gone into the main problem that the writer wants to talk about, and already the writer is spreading a load of nonsense. The writer's main complaint is how the game's portrayal of of romance in Kawakami is bad because it merely treats the subject as a taboo romantic conquest rather than its actual predatory nature. Oh wow, writer, are you gonna talk about how women can be just as predatory as men in terms of finding romantic partners that are younger than them? Some of them even go to illegal territories? Are we gonna talk about how it's totally unfair that the media and society in general treat predator women less badly as predator men? Well, not really. The writer spends the next paragraph talking about a very simplistic idea of masculinity. To lack agency is to lack masculinity. Men tend to be actors, whereas women tend to be acted upon. Writer, I don't know what they've been feeding you in these liberal universities, but I can tell you that it's really not that simple. You acknowledge that it isn't, but the fact that you had this preconceived notion in the first place just speaks volumes in what kind of things that they've been teaching you and how you see the world through your lens. It's really fascinating how people can be convinced into believing certain ideologies by presenting the opposite ideology ideology as not only bad, but something that even a five-year-old can comprehend. They present the idea of masculinity as dominance and femininity as submission, even though both masculinity and femininity are traits that cover a lot more than just two things. It is true that one part of masculinity is about being strong, but being strong isn't just about being the most dominant alpha male in the room who can beat the living crap out of people. It's also about being responsible, being able to confront your personal weaknesses, admitting that you have those weaknesses and doing your best to overcome them, which is an issue that Kanji eventually learn as time goes on. A character from a game that you claim to be your favorite and you played for 90 hours, but it's clear to me that you need to replay it again. Oh wait, you're terrified so that can't be done. As for femininity, while it is true that being passive can be considered a feminine trait, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. Being loving, caring, and compassionate can be considered passive traits, but those are very good traits that more and more people need to have these days, rather than mindless and aggressive hate. It is possible to be a strong woman who still have feminine traits. If you haven't seen Wolf Children, which you should, the mother character is the perfect example to highlight my point. She would sacrifice everything in her life to make sure that both of her children are able to have a good, long-lasting life. The thing is, and this is probably a topic for another video, your idea of being masculine is being a strong, dominant alpha male. Your idea of being strong is being as physically strong as men, when there are many other ways for you to be able to be strong while also being feminine. Sayed Nijima from Persona 5 isn't strong because of her position as a prosecutor. She is strong because she is able to get through a lot of her issues despite the circumstances surrounding her, and still stay professional and level-headed throughout the way. Kobayashi from Dragon Maid is not strong because she has a Dragon Maid. She is strong because she is willing to get through deadly scenarios in order to properly take care of the two dragons that she has. She is willing to sacrifice her own life just for the sake of the happiness of her maids. Unfortunately, people are fed with the idea that being masculine is strong and being feminine is weak. Therefore, strong female characters are female characters that can do the things that men do instead of female characters that are actually strong and can overcome many adversity regardless of their flaws. And yes, some Sometimes those adversities require them to do the things that men do, such as in Kobayashi's case, but simply doing the things that men do doesn't make you strong. They can say that as much as they want that it's not true, which it isn't, but it's still ingrained within their minds that society thinks that it is. The writer spends a good paragraph talking about how toxic masculinity is the suffering notion that men must adhere to a strict set of gender norms. The writer says that this disempowers women and emotionally devastates men because they're constantly 
being told that being masculine is being strong, and being strong means having control, and being a victim means losing that control, and losing that control means you're not a real man. Again, this is a very simplistic belief that the writer says that it's wrong, but it's still ingrained in the writer's head that it's true within the society that she's living in. The writer then talks about Kamoshida, and how Kamoshida is a very attractive man that uses his power as a teacher to abuse his students. The writer uses this to make a point that it's terrible for people who have authority over you to abuse that power for their own personal gratification. The writer uses this point to make another point about how the game ignores that lesson completely in the form of the social links between Ren and Kawakami and Ren and Takemi. And I have to give this article credit for being the very first published article that I know of that attacks two of the game's top tier waifus. The writer's first point is basically because these two women are women who have a position of power over the main character, the game somehow doesn't treat it as a bad thing. Uh, it's not. The writer then asks the question, why are none of the game's villains women? Well, none of the major villains are, but An Social Link has that broad, and Hifumi Social Link has her mother. Two examples that are much better used to highlight the point about women abusing their authorities. And yet the article is particularly fixated on the two women who have authority over the protagonist, but doesn't abuse them for their own gains. Why specifically on them when there are better examples to use? Well, it's for the sake of a cherry picking to make a point. The point is, despite these women having an authority over the protagonist, the women are portrayed as innocent people who are lost, rather than the power hungry maniacs that describe most of the male antagonists of the game, because the belief that they are women, and women must be innocent, and therefore needing a man like the protagonist to save them, thus perpetuating the common belief that women are weak, men are strong, and that women need men to survive. It's amazing how these writers and ideologues look at the world that they're living in. They look at the world in a very simplistic ideological lens that interpret everything in a way that only makes sense to that ideology. It could be that Atlas do all of those things to indoctrinate people into these harmful beliefs, or it could be just a story about two women who are in need of help. I mean, for the record, Takemi and Kawakami aren't the only two social links who are in need of help with the protagonist. Iwai has connections with a freaking Yakuza, and even he needs the protagonist's help. And as I said before, the game does have women who abuse their power and influence to other people. Hifumi Social Link and An Social Link are somewhat centered on those women. So the writer's interpretation of this event is horrendously misinformed, incredibly misleading, and actually perpetuates more of the common belief about gender roles, more so than the actual games that she criticized. The writer's description of their social links is incredibly revealing on the writer's entrenched personal belief. Furthermore, the game prevents us from seeing the behaviors as repulsive because, once again, we are a man. Men are expected to want, especially from attractive women. If they don't, if they are to wait, question, or resist, society tends to perceive this as a failing of a man. Men are actors, so act! Yeah, uh, the world doesn't work that way. The world as depicted in Persona 5 also doesn't work that way. I know you're trying to refute the argument that the world works in that way, but this is not you refuting the argument. This is you perpetuating the same worldview that you claim to be against. This is you looking at Persona through the lens of the belief that you consider to be harmful, a lens that no one else in the world has looked through because it's nonsensical and stupid. No one looks at the social link between the protagonist and Kawakami, or the protagonist and Takemi, in the same way that you do. No one looks at the stories of these characters and use it as a way to highlight the point that women are submissive, weak, and only needs men. Only you do, writer. And thanks to you, looking at the game through that particular lens, you are reinforcing that belief more and more. It's a rather demented form of reverse psychology. The article concludes that the writer can go on and on about Atlas's moral stance. What moral stance, writer? Are you saying that everything that's being depicted in the game is a representation of Atlas's moral stance? That's nonsensical. That's like saying the people who made Silence of the Lambs are also eating people in real life. The writer ends the article by saying, Despite Atlas being repeatedly called upon to make socially conscious changes to the game and do better, the studio continues to release titles that, at their core, are entrenched in harmful ideologies. Writer, the only way this game is entrenched with harmful ideologies is if you interpret it as such. 
such, and you did interpret it as such when no one else interpreted it that way, because it's wrong, misleading, factually inaccurate, and only serves to perpetuate that harmful ideology even more than it is to dismantle it. The writer then talks about how Persona 5 Royale carries on this tradition. Yes, I know they didn't change much from the original. Shocking news to everyone. The writer then says that while it is simple to acknowledge and overlook the more blatant ways in which the game is problematic- Okay, 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 hold up a second, writer. If what you mean by overlooking is not looking the game through an arbitrary ideological lens that paints an entire company with a barrage of buzzwords, then yes, I suppose we should overlook a lot of these problematic elements. The writer continues that while you can overlook all of them, and you should if you are a sane person, it is the insidious ways these ideas manifest that are more difficult for the players to detect. Good, because they're not there. They're only there because you look at it through your own personal ideological lens. They're only there because you woefully misinterpret the game to suit your needs. Laughably, the writer claims that thanks to the fact that it's difficult to detect, it leads into the subtle indoctrination of beliefs that hurt us all. Do you seriously believe that Persona 5, one of the most popular JRPGs of all time, contributes into these harmful beliefs within our society? You are so far off the mark, I'm surprised that you're not saying that Persona 5 causes the pandemic.